longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Amen. How wonderful, how precious. Good morning to you. It's great to see you here on this day. We're thankful you're here. I'm thankful I'm here, here, physically, in this place, surrounded by this water in this morning. It's going to be a delight and a joy. And uh, folks, I can't tell you anything more exciting than to be able to demonstrate this, this public profession of faith that baptism represents. How many times have you heard me say, this won't save you. This water will not wash away your sins. It won't do it. But it does show that your sins have been washed away by whom? By Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. That's what we're demonstrating. We're going to baptize two now that we want to uh, present to you. First is Brittany. No, we need this system. Sometime around. This way. This is Brittany. Y'all know Brittany. She's been coming here for a while now, and we're, we're delighted about that. And uh, she and I were talking at the Fall Fest, as a matter of fact. And um, we discovered that though she received Christ a number of years ago, um, she needed to be baptized as a believer. I'm shortening the story, okay? And she wanted to, she wanted to be a part of our fellowship and said, yes, she was willing to be baptized as a believer at 38th Avenue Baptist Church. So I have a question for you. I'm going to say something to you and I have a question for you, okay? The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that, that you'd be saved. So here's my question. Who's your Lord? Jesus Christ. All right, go in front of that bench there. Go ahead and take a seat. So I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Slow and easy. This is Daniel. We have a slick spot on the steps, y'all. This is Daniel. Daniel comes all the way from Nigeria, and uh, he has told us as well that he wanted to be baptized as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We spoke a few minutes ago. He met the Lord some 10, ten years ago. Now, he grew up in church, like a whole lot of us. But you know what? You can grow up in church and never know the Lord. But he met the Lord, and his parents told him over there, of all the churches you can go to, go look for a Baptist church. Go look for one of them. So here he is with us today. Daniel, Jesus says, the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. Who's your Lord? Christ. Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Daniel, I baptize you, my brother, in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you. Well, good morning. Speaking of Africa, my friends at Carterville Baptist Church are in Africa, about a dozen of them this week. Uh, my friend Ben Skipper and his wife and some others are in Africa this week. We want to remember them. I'd like to recognize all the veterans this morning. Uh, State, uh, the federal holiday legally was, I'm hearing an echo somewhere, 
one of me is enough. <laughs> uh, Friday and then Saturday was uh, the 11th, the legal day, but uh, Thursday is when we're going to recognize with senior adults uh, in our luncheon. So I would like to ask all the veterans, if you would, please, and if you represent a veteran who has passed away, would you please stand in recognizing our veterans? Also, I'd like to recognize all of those who helped yesterday. I understood from Carolyn, my source, for many reasons, many ways, uh, that over 100 of these boxes were packed yesterday. And if you helped with that minister yesterday, would you please stand? Peggy, you helped, others, young adults. Over, over 100 of these boxes were packed. And I believe this week they're going to be carried to the uh, central place. Okay. Also, this Wednesday, if you will, please note our quarterly business meeting follows the fellowship meal at 545. So please come and bring your favorite side dish or a dessert, and the church will provide the meat. And then finally, Senior Adult Luncheon will be this Thursday, 1130 a.m., Strix will be catering our lunch, and so we're looking forward to that. You don't have to bring anything. Francine, you just come and uh, partake of the uh, smoked chicken, baked beans, potato salad, and my favorite fruit banana pudding. And so you please come, senior adults, this coming. Several are coming from Brookdale, and we're looking forward to that. The Word of God says in Psalm 121, where does our help come from? The Bible says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So whether we're young, middle-aged, or old, if we need help, God can help us. For God so loved the world that he gave. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for our veterans. Thank you for those who helped yesterday to pack the shoe boxes. Father, I pray today that as we come to your presence, that we'll lay aside all the cares of this week, all the cares of our life, that we will look to you, the author and the finisher. Father, I thank you for our veterans. I thank you that I was able to serve in the Navy and friends of mine were. And Father, I pray that you would bless the veterans that are living now and the memory of those who have passed on before us. Father, today I thank you for our church. I thank you for our music ministry. I thank you for our pastor. And I pray now that you would let the words of our mouths today and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our Redeemer, in whose name I pray, amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. As we stand, we stand and turn around and tell your neighbor, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. As we sing, how great is our God.
may be seated. As we sing the hymn, ye gather together. as we sing, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Y'all feel that you want to stand and sing? You can as we give praises to the Lord. Thank you. 
Good job, guys.
Why are these folks in the dark on this side? <laughs> Good morning to you. We're reading this morning from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Colossians 2, 1 through 5 is the Word of God. When you find that, please stand in honor of the Word of God. I, by the way, I just received a message from Serena. We were supposed to baptize her this morning, and her boys are sick, so she couldn't come. So we'll have to reschedule that for a date in December. We'll do with that. Here's the Word of God. Verse 1 of Colossians chapter 2. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Father, I pray that you will speak to us in this message this morning. Make the Word of God plain and clear. Give me the ability to articulate this message. Bind the enemy and give us freedom in Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I find it convicting that Paul, who had never seen the Colossian believers, nor the Laodiceans, he wrestled in prayer for them. Now, this is something that I need you to, to detect in the passage, and it's found in that first verse in the phrase at the beginning, what a great conflict. Those words right there. The word for conflict is a word for a hand-to-hand, -hand, Ronnie, combat. Hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face up close and personal. I want you to understand something as I go into this message. You have, and I have, our church has, everything working for it in Christ Jesus but everything working against it by the enemy, the prince of the power of the air, and this world, but as well as that, your flesh. If you did not declare your flesh crucified this day, then your flesh is working hard to keep you from understanding the Word of God. It's just a plain and simple fact. And here Paul is saying, he has a great conflict. He's in a wrestling match for these churches that he's never seen. My conviction is the fact that he prays so for churches he's never had a part of. He's heard about them, but he's never been there personally. He didn't plant those churches. He spent no time there, but yet he prayed for them, wrestling in prayer, as he did so. I don't know of very many who do that, who have done that in their lives, where they have heard of a church and they have poured out their souls uh, when they did so. Now, I did experience this in one sense a number of years ago when I was in China and I was in the city of Chichihar 
and we had gotten word that Melissa had been hospitalized, and she was there, and I had just received that word, and uh, you, of course, you don't know what's going on. You don't have any idea of anything at that point. I'm, I'm, I don't know how many thousand miles away. I can't run down to Slidell where she was. I can't do any of that. So I told this church, this group of church leaders, and they immediately stopped the entire conference and they began praying for our daughter. And they poured their heart out and wept and cried out to God on her behalf in that moment. So I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen it. But I wonder sometimes if, if I have ever reached that point where I have prayed for people I don't know with that kind of passion. And um, this convicts me, quite frankly. But what Paul prays for in this passage of Scripture is for their growth. They, he wants them to be growing churches. Now, I want your mind to, to shift gears for a moment because when I use the word church growth, I'm not speaking necessarily about numbers. Well, I would love to see this building full, so don't misunderstand me. Numbers are good, but at the same time, there's a level of growth that supersedes numbers. There's a level of growth that precedes numbers. And this is what we're looking at in this passage of Scripture. And there are five signs of a growing church that I want to share with you this morning. Five signs. Number one, it is growing in courage. Now, your King James Version Bible, if that's what you are using today, uses the word comfort. I pray for you to be comforted. That's what the King James Version uses. We use that word differently than when it was first written in the King James Version. The word parakaleo has, a, has a, 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 a fuller meaning than just comfort. Why, this is a cognate of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Paraclete, you know that word, many of you do. That is paraclete, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But let me say something to you. There, there's... There's little as sad as a discouraged church or as discouraged believers within a church fellowship. That is a heartbreaking sight uh, for any pastor, but it should be for any believer to see discouragement like that. This is one of the devil's favorite tools, discouragement. That he, he uses that probably more than anything else. He wants us to focus on the downside, always. He wants you to develop a critical spirit of others. He wants you to grow a root of bitterness so that you can defile others around you. That's his desire. So if he can discourage 38th Avenue Baptist Church, Naciones Church, or any church, for that matter, if he can do that, he's going to do it. A discouraged church or, or a discouraged Christ follower will live in defeat, not in victory. Do you hear me? They will act as though they've been beaten. Y'all saw any football games yesterday? There were a few teams that when they played, after the, yeah, Ronnie's shaking his head over there. He knows Ole Miss got slaughtered. Afterwards, when they get on that field, if they don't have the right mindset, they'll play like they've lost the game from the outset. I remember when Larry Fedora was coach over here at USM, and they ran over to um, South Carolina, I think it was, to play a game. And he got out on the field, and in the first, from the first play, South Carolina dominated in that game. And they did a close-up on Larry Fedora, and the look on his face was priceless. I cannot, 
I cannot describe nor can I imitate the look on his face. But it was a look of utter and complete devastation and defeat. I've seen it in the eyes of church members, though. I have. I've looked at church members who lived as though they're defeated. Well, how does the church become discouraged? I can name several things, but I just want to tell you three things that will discourage a church, that will be discouraging in a church. Number one is an underdeveloped faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Number two, unexpected crises. You know, churches are going to face crises, aren't they? It's going to happen. We're going to endure that in our lives. But we cannot let the crisis defeat us. We must not let it defeat us. Number three, unresolved conflicts. These three things will discourage a church. Many other things will too. Now let me give you the essence of the word parakaleo that I've given to you this morning. As I said, it is a cognate, that has a cognate, paraclete for us, which is one of the names of the Holy Spirit. The classic use of the word is more than comfort, however. The classic use of the word is encourage, encourage, to instill courage in another. This is the classic use of the word. It describes a general before his troops. In one particular battle in the Greek writings, the men had lost courage. One of the leaders came to them and spoke to his troops and rallied his troops and they regained their courage. They were encouraged by what the leader had said and they went on and they won their battle. This is what it refers to. Let me tell you how God encourages us. First, he does it inwardly through the work of the Holy Spirit. This is one of the things that he does. Then he does it outwardly through other believers whose faith has held strong. And he also does it contemplatively. That is, as we dive into the Word of God and meditate in it, and we stand on the great and precious promises of God. In these ways, God encourages a church. So whenever you find yourself discouraged, get back to the Word of God and let God speak to your heart. Amen? This is one of the things that helps a church to grow. Number two, the church will grow when it's growing in unity in love. Now, our text uses the word that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. And that particular word, A.T. Robertson describes as parts of the body being knit together as one body. We are made up of billions of cells, even more than that, all of us present. And when you have a wound, a cut or a gash or a bruise or whatever it may be, your body's cells that sends a message out and your cells and your body will join together to be sure the damaged cells are healed and if they're beyond repair, that they are replaced with good, healthy cells. When you become ill with an infection, your cells coalesce to resist the foreign bacteria and viruses that have invaded your body. This is what your body does. This is a very simplistic description, but this is what happens. This is the idea behind being knit together. So when a bone is broken, the cells in that bone knit together, and the bone is what we call 
mended in that case. Would you believe, though, that it's possible for a church to be knit together by the wrong things? Would you believe that? In your body, sometimes cells become rogue cells, and they do their own thing. And they can become strong enough to defend against the good cells that try to eradicate them. Or they can persuade those good cells to join them in their cause, and then those good cells slowly become rogue cells as well. Now that's very, very uh, basic what I'm sharing, but it describes things that we know about like cancer. Sometimes this happens to churches. They may come together around a cause, or they may come together, coalesce, around the cost of doing ministry. Y'all remember the fights, the stories about fights over colors and carpets? Y'all remember those stories? I don't need to share another old passe story, but you know exactly what I'm speaking about in this case. Churches in those cases would take sides and coalesce around green walls or tan walls, around blue carpet, or red carpet, around chandeliers, which they couldn't spell to begin with, or a new organ in the church. All of those things they would find themselves around. The verse says, be knit together in love. There's your emphasis. This is what we must wrestle in prayer for all the time in our church to be knit together in, with, or by agape, that selfless love of God. And this is where it gets interesting. We love others, you see, to the extent that we understand how much God loved us and has forgiven us. Do you agree with that? I want to tell you a story from the book of Luke. A certain man, a very religious man, invited Jesus over one day for a meal. And as they lounged around the table, now you and I think of tables with legs on it. Theirs were lower to the ground, and you sat on these large pillows, and you had a pillow to prop on for your arm, and you sat around those tables, and as they lounged around the table, a lady came in weeping. And this woman who was weeping came to Jesus and fell on her knees and cried on his feet. And her tears wet Jesus' feet, and she took her hair and mopped those tears up with her hair at that moment. Now keep in mind something here, please. A woman's hair, according to the Word of God, is her crown of glory. That's what it is. And so she was taking her glory and rubbing and mopping up the old dirt on the feet of Jesus and giving Him greater glory than even her hair symbolized in her life. Well, that very religious man snorted to himself as he looked at that woman. I can hear his voice scowling. He says in his heart, if Jesus really were a prophet, He'd know what kind of woman that was. Translation, 21st century English. This woman's a streetwalker. I never let her touch me.
Jesus knew what he was thinking. So he asked the religious man, after he told him a story, who would love more? The one forgiven a debt of $10 or the one who was forgiven a debt of $10,000? Who would love more? And the religious man said, well, the one who was forgiven the most. And he said, she has done for me what you wouldn't even do. Common courtesy you wouldn't do. And this streetwalker lavished love on me like you wouldn't. And he looked at her and said, go, your sins are forgiven. Let me say it again, please. We will love one another to the extent we understand how much God loves us. And the love of God is the glue that knits us together. And the love of God, said Ron Dunn, is the death blow to pride and gossip and criticism and anything else that will discourage a church. It certainly is. Number three, a growing church grows in understanding and knowledge. Look at your verse. Look at your passage again. The Bible says this in verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. To there I'm going to read. To that point. If all you get from the Word of God is what someone preaches on a Sunday morning, then you're not growing in understanding and knowledge. You need a healthy diet of the Word of God. You need personal Bible study. You need small groups like we have on Sunday mornings and like our D groups on Sunday evenings. You need these things so that you are able to grow in your faith. We need those things together. There will be growth and understanding and knowledge, which means greater confidence of the work of God in your life. That's just one of the small truths that the words full assurance means for you. This is, that full assurance means overflowing and beyond confident. Sometimes people, when I have spoken the word of God, they have accused me of being cocky. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. And I would just be flabbergasted by hearing such a thing. Folks, I'm not cocky with the Word of God. I'm convinced by the Word of God. I'm convicted by the Word of God. I'm compelled by the Word of God and the love of Christ Jesus. And if that makes me cocky, okay, then I guess I need a new hat. You know what I mean? You will overflow with confidence that God is working in you and around you. Growing an understanding and knowledge comes by lifting the lid to the treasure chest of the riches of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You will never completely, fully understand all the glory and all the wonder and all the splendor and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will never do it. But folks, it's fun digging in the treasure chest. It's marvelous digging in that treasure chest. I'm telling you, God blesses when we do that and seek those treasures in Christ Jesus. You see, the mysteries of God, all those mysteries we mentioned last week, are all hidden in Jesus Christ. 
all of them. A church, a growing church, is growing in discernment. Verse 4 of our passage. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Why, I have good news and I have bad news today. I'll give you the bad news first. The enemy is going to poke and he's going to prod and he's going to look for as many ways as possible to deceive you into following bad doctrine and false doctrine. He'll use persuasive, charismatic, I'm not talking about theology now, I'm talking about personality, these, these overpowering speakers who when you hear them, you'll say, why that person is worth listening to. All the while, this is what the devil does. Y'all, my mouth is dry today. Forgive me for carrying his glass around. But I want you to hear what the devil does. I want you to know he will give you 99% truth and 1% error. He will do that. He will lead you to a place where you hear a certain person <coughs> speak or preach or teach, and you will say, well, I know the Bible said this. I thought I knew it, but this person is saying that. And he will beguile you and entice you within that. The greatest harvest field today for cults and false teachers of all stripes is the Baptist church. We have become biblically illiterate in the church of today. And I've told you this before, but I'm going to repeat it again. Surveys have shown that only about 25% of professing Christians have a biblical world view. Only about 25%. That begins with God as creator. That begins with instantaneous creation, spontaneous creation done by God. That's where it all begins. I read this morning, and I guarantee you somebody's going to fall for it. And I'm going to tell you why they're going to fall for it in a second, besides the devil doing it. But I read this morning, scientists are now saying... They're now saying there were, there were two big bangs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there wasn't even one big bang. Unless you can call the word of Jesus when he said, Light be, and there was light. Then I reckon if that counts as a big bang, there was one. Because his word will knock anything, won't it? Well, now listen to me. Why am I telling you? Because somebody's going to believe that. And they're going to say, well, I think there were two big bangs, not just one. And they're going to accept that as truth. Why are they going to accept that as truth? Because we have been taught for the past three or four more and plus years to, to, to let the scientists do the thinking for us and to trust those scientists and quit trying to research it for ourselves. I read that one yesterday. That was a headline story yesterday that scientists say we should let them do the research and not do our own. Well, I know a great Hebrew word for that, hogwash. I'm telling you, folks, start your research here on the Word of God. On the Word of God. Mm. If you don't, then you'll be Deceived, beguiled, bewitched by false teachers. Paul told the Ephesian elders there would be grievous wolves to rise up from their very midst. Miss Joanne, you know this. Not every preacher that preaches is a God-called preacher. 
Not everyone that stands in the pulpit has been called by God. There are people who are false preachers that rise up from the midst of churches. So if you think Satan's going to let you grow as a believer and not fight you all the way, you got another thing coming because he's going to do it. Well, I said bad news and good news. That's a whole bunch of bad news. Here's the good news. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than the prince of the power of the air. Greater is he that is in you than all the false teachers that may come your way. Greater is he. You are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And he is in you. If you've repented and believed the Lord and the gospel, there's one more that I'll share with you. A growing church is growing in spiritual discipline. Verse 5, though I am absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now there are two military terms very appropriate for this Sunday after Veterans Day. Two military terms in this verse of Scripture. Paul loved to use military terms. The first one is the word order, which is a reference to ordering the ranks. When they called us to muster, even in boot camp, there was a specific distance that we must we must place between one another. And we'd all run out to the, to the tarmac and we'd all get into that tarmac. The grinder is what we called it. And we'd get on that grinder and then for the man next to us, we'd place our hand and we had a specific distance we were to stand from that individual. There are a couple of reasons why. One, you're holding on a, a, a rifle. And if you're too close together and you begin to move that rifle, you're going to pop that dude or he's going to pop you. And it won't feel good because those things were not pleasant. They were rather heavy. Well, it also gave an equidistant rank as the people came and they looked at you. And this is one of the things that they're telling us. Even, by the way, when we had a four-man detail in the company, we were placed in order of ranks. They march and step with one another. There was one who called the cadence, and the soldiers all march to that cadence. Our captain is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who calls the cadence. And he tells us in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. May I tell you what that word means? It means walk in step to the cadence of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. The next word is steadfastness. And as this word relates to the military, it speaks of a solid front. Now, a picture that I wished I could get into our heads in a better way than just my words about the Roman armies is to tell you about them. They would form up in a square. That's how their formations would be designed. They got their order right, and they marched in a square. There were those in the front who marched with their shields directly in front of them. Those on the outer ranks marched with their shields to the side like this. Those in the back prepared their shields and kept them just in case they reversed uh, direction and did an about face. And then their shields would be in the front. Every one of them was prepared whichever way they went for that front line to be the strongest line. Those in the middle... Of those, of those ranks, of those companies that were marching, as they marched, 
they would take their shields when the command was given and when they would run their shields above their heads so that when the flaming arrows of the enemy came, their shields would quench the fiery darts of the enemy that shot at them. Where have I heard this before? Take up the shield of faith with which you can quench the fiery darts, the flaming arrows of the enemy. You don't want that front line to break down. You want the front line to be firm, as solid as a rock. You want your shield of faith well positioned. Paul said, I rejoice when I hear about your order, your marching in step with the Holy Spirit, and your steadfastness. You have a solid front against the enemy that's trying to come against you. Now, I read somewhere that 70% of churches are plateaued or declining. In many cases, I'm persuaded that 70% of churches that are in that condition, plateaued or declining, happens because the spiritual life of the membership is in a condition that permits it. But it doesn't have to be that way. Churches can grow. But first, the hearts of the members must grow. There must be unity knit together by the love of God. There must be courage and confidence. But I want to tell you something. We can do it because we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus who loves us. More than conquerors, ladies and gentlemen. No reason for us to ever walk with our hands hanging down with weak knees and weak ankles. No reason at all. Because our Savior is with us. Our Lord is with us. Greater is He who is in us than He who is in this world. What about you as a believer? Are you growing? Or are you just kind of there? I saw some photos. I was cleaning up my photos last night. Yesterday afternoon. Man, those things get on your, your phone, your iPad, you know, and you just accumulate. Is up into the thousands of photos. And I was like, I gotta clean some of this stuff out. And I was looking back through it and I saw some pictures, some photographs of people I know. If I called their names, you might know who they are. They used to be teachers. Now they only come to church every once in a while. I saw some of that. My heart hurt. Did your heart ever hurt when you think about, man, that person used to, they were leading, they were out front. Now look at them. Your heart ever hurt? My heart hurt when I saw that. A growing believer won't get in that condition. 
Oh, they'll take time off. They need to. Everybody needs a break every once in a while, don't they? But just, <laughs> just every once in a while. You don't need a permanent break. Nobody here needs a permanent break. Nobody. You get your break in heaven. Eek. Eek. Lord, I, I just present this time to you, this invitation. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will pierce our hearts and you'll speak first to the believers to the Christ followers and reveal to them whether they are growing or they're plateaued or in a decline. And if that's you, you just kind of walking in a rut and come take these steps and turn it into a place of prayer today and say, Lord, I don't want, I want to be a growing believer and I want my church to be a growing church. And you come and do that today during the invitation time. If you don't yet know Christ, if you've never trusted Christ, if you've never by an act of your own faith and will turn from sin and turn to Jesus, he stands ready to receive you now. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And he speaks now. And he's knocking on your door. And he says, let me in. You tell him, I preach you talking about me. I need to let you in. And I turn from my sin. Come into my life. And if you pray that, words to that effect, and you mean that in this invitation time, you come tell me. If you are a Christ follower, and you have not yet been baptized as a believer, then you come tell me, I need to be baptized just like you did this morning with those other guys. I need it. And you request that of us. Father, this is your invitation. I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, bring glory to in the church through Christ Jesus in this morning. Thank you. Let's stand and do business with God. Come on now, obey him.
Let's give the Lord a hand, shall we? While Lane is making his way here, I know you've heard this already, but our business meeting this coming uh, Wednesday night, you certainly want to be here for that. It's our annual meeting. We have a number of things to present, and we need you to be present for that and for those considerations. We'll also share a fellowship meal, won't we? It'd be good. I don't know what it is yet because you hadn't brought it yet, but it'd be good. No question in my mind. I had never had anything bad here. Unless somebody tried to slip okra in on me one time. Then you'll know I'd be praying against you, not for you. Well, um, this evening we'll have our, our D groups at 5 o'clock, I believe. And uh, you come, be ready for that. And we'll have a time of prayer this evening. I know the Lord will bless you. You ready to pray? If you are our guest, and I've not spoken with you, I'm going to be over here on this side. And I'd love to say hello to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We just uh, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to come and worship you as we did today. I pray that uh, this church will take this message to heart and that we will be a growing church. That, that we'll grow one in one in unity under you, Lord. I pray that, that you'll continue to let your presence be felt here. If there's anyone lost here today, I pray that uh, they'll get that right before they leave. I pray that all this in your name. Amen. Thank you. 